All right, folks, thanks for joining us today for this RCR Wireless News webinar on the future of Wi-Fi. My name is Kelly Hill. I'm an editor at RCR Wireless News, and I'm going to introduce you to the rest of our participants, and then we will get right into the presentations. Um, just a quick note, we do have a special report that's being published on this topic today, and uh, you will also have the opportunity to ask questions at the end, so feel free to submit questions as they come to mind. Joining us today, we have Kevin Robinson, VP of Marketing for Wi-Fi Alliance, William Butte, CTO and founder at Wildfire 5G. We have Patrick Welsh, Executive Director of Public Policy and Law for Verizon, Todd Mersch, co-founder and EVP of Sales and Marketing for XL Air, and also Dean Brunner, SVP of Government Affairs for Qualcomm. Um, so just uh, a few takeaways from the report that's being posted today on rcrwireless.com. Um, we do have new Wi-Fi standards emerging this year and next that improve current capabilities and open up new Wi-Fi use cases and devices. Uh, I think we'll hear more about that from some of our other panelists. Um, Wi-Fi is converging with cellular in both behavior and spectrum. Uh, we've got features like Passpoint for automated authentication in Wi-Fi, and we also have LTE U, LAA, License Assisted Access, and uh, LTE Wi-Fi ag aggregation in cellular that are designed to make each technology act more like the other. Um, there's still a lot of unanswered questions, I think. Uh, we will get into LTEU uh, as part of our discussion today. Um, Wi-Fi offload. In general, this is something that really helps mobile service providers cope with the enormous growth in mobile data traffic that I'm sure we're all aware of. Um, new opportunities are expected to increase Wi-Fi's visibility and manageability, uh, especially uh, carrier Wi-Fi, so that service providers of all kinds can offer more services and uh, also leverage analytics uh, and, for, and IoT applications. Um, and also, I, I'm hoping today we'll also talk a little bit more about better in-home Wi-Fi coverage. So those are just a few things that get covered in the report. Um, it was, uh, so that should be available today for free download. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and jump into our presentations. We're starting off with Kevin Robinson of Wi-Fi Alliance. Kevin? Thanks, Kelly. Um, so, for all of you, for all of you viewers there, uh, I think I'll start out with just very briefly telling some of you um, who, for, who Wi-Fi Alliance is, in, in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, Wi-Fi Alliance is the worldwide network of companies who brought you Wi-Fi. And uh, Kelly, you can go ahead and jump onto the next slide. Um, over the past 16 years, we've worked to make Wi-Fi really one of the most one of the world's greatest technology success stories. Um, Wi-Fi in terms of proliferation is up there with, you know, the FM radio and the cellular phone in terms of, you know, one of the, one of the most prolific technologies um, available. Right now, there is an installed base of, of roughly 7 billion devices serving not only consumers, but enterprises and service providers. Um, and so if you just think about that for a minute, there's more than one Wi-Fi device for every man, woman, and child on the globe. Um, so again, very, very prolific technology, um, plays a very key role, a very critical role in the everyday lives of people uh, around the world. As an industry, we're shipping roughly 3 billion devices per year. Um, of course, Wi-Fi is in just about every laptop, tablet, smartphone. Um, I would actually say this is a little bit conservative. Uh, it's also in just about every uh, you know, Blu-ray player, television, uh, it's extremely hard to go out and get any type of uh, consumer electronic device and not have Wi-Fi as, as a primary connectivity mode in that, in that device. Uh, Wi-Fi also carries more than half of all the world's internet traffic. Um, so again, it is the workhorse of the internet today. Uh, we see that Wi-Fi adoption is growing and diversifying into new markets, and I'm going to get into a little bit more detail on that um, a little bit later in, in the presentation. Um, so, Kelly, if you can go ahead and jump on to the next slide. Um, this is just looking at the, the device shipments that, that we, have, uh, we as an industry have, um, have made over the past, over our history, um, and you can see you know, very, very strong growth. In fact, we've uh, passed 15 billion uh, cumulative shipments in, the, in this past year. Uh, and we expect that to grow in large part with movement into some of these new emerging markets that we'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, but the expectations are that by 2020, we're going to be shipping as an industry, or we'll have cumulatively shipped as an industry, um, almost 30 billion devices. Now, um, Kelly, if you can go ahead and jump on to the next slide. Uh, one of the overarching themes that's really delivered that um, and generated that very impressive past growth 
is Wi-Fi's proven track record of opening new markets. Uh, Wi-Fi is, is really unique among many technologies in just the, the, um, the flexibility and it, and its, abil and its um, capabilities that allow it to serve a very wide array of, of different use cases. And that's why you find Wi-Fi in just about every type of uh, you know, scenario and, cust and, um, and market segment. Of course, Wi-Fi is absolutely a strategic imperative for mobile and fixed operators, um, allowing them to meet this, this insatiable consumer demand for, for, uh, for consumption of data, whether it's high definition video, um, you know, large file transfers, moving all of your photos from your phone into the cloud. Um, again, Wi-Fi really serving as, as the workhorse for um, mobile and fixed operators. Uh, and of course, one of the ways we're, we're doing that is through improvements to, to the, the you know, core, uh, core Wi-Fi technology with even greater speeds and greater network capacity. Of course, today's Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi certified AC, uh, providing gigabit data rates and, and twice the network capacity of, of legacy, of legacy Wi-Fi. We see Wi-Fi in a number of city deployments. Of course, Link NYC has been in the news quite recently. Um, and one of the reasons it's, it's been in the news is the use of Passpoint, providing this very seamless cellular-like authentication experience to Wi-Fi hotspots. That your, your device is going to hop on that network without any user intervention whatsoever. Um, another example just in my, in my daily life is Time Warner Cable. Uh, my phone uses will hop on virtually any Time Warner business class access point, no matter where I go, whether it's when I go get my hair cut, whether it's um, you know, uh, visiting anybody who's using Time Warner cable, my phone's gonna automatically authenticate and provide that very secure connection uh, without having to use my cellular data. Um, Wi-Fi plays a role in a number of different segments, whether it's digital health, um, automotive, of course, is a new one. I find it quite interesting that uh, some of the newer automotive ads are actually highlighting Wi-Fi and connectivity as one of the primary benefits or primary new features in that car. It's less about horsepower and gas mileage. It's now about connectivity. Um, Kelly, if you can go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. Now, when we look at kind of the future growth of Wi-Fi, it's very much going to be driven by Wi-Fi's role in growing markets. And Wi-Fi will continue to play a significant role in, in emerging markets, uh, in particular in the Internet of Things. Um, expectations are that we'll have roughly 34 billion devices connected to the Internet by 2020. Um, IoT represents an $11 trillion opportunity by 2025, which is roughly more than 10% of the world's economy. Um, so with kind of with this very, you know, immense opportunity, uh, Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi industry has a tremendous opportunity for growth um, and success over, over the coming decade. Uh, next slide, please. One of the ways we're going to, we're going to deliver and, and capture those opportunities is through technology development to meet those market needs. While Wi-Fi is certainly a mature technology, you know, we've been around for more than, for more than 16 years, um, it is by no means slowing down, and the Wi-Fi industry continues to innovate. Uh, we see innovations such as additions to Wi-Fi certified AC coming this year with technology, with capabilities like multi-user MIMO uh, to increase overall network capacity, as well as wider channels to provide higher top-end data rates. We're also going to be seeing multi-gigabit speeds for in-room ultra-high definition streaming using 60 gigahertz this year. Um, and in addition, we'll, we'll see some, um, some interesting addition, um, capabilities around indoor outdoor location so the ability to provide sub meter uh, location data based on a wi-fi network overlay so very interesting in the retail space in the wi-fi calling space um, and, and others as well um, we're going to see greater device mobility improve network utilization and enhance performance all of these are in the works um, it's again understanding that wi-fi is um, a strategic imperative and a critical component of carriers networks and Wi-Fi will continue to evolve to ensure that we are meeting those needs of the operators both fixed and mobile. Uh, 
Um, there are many more innovative uh, enhancements in the works, and there's more than 20 different technology initiatives within Wi-Fi Alliance. And so um, if, if you're interested in the, in the deck here, there's actually a list of all the different work areas um, that we're, that we're um, we're embarking upon, including things like much easier device provisioning in the home, very, they're very suitable to, to the Internet of Things. Um, so, Kelly, if you could please move on to the next slide. Um, and just because I knew, oh, I think we skipped one there. There we go. Um, because I know this is a, is, is a question that will likely come up on the on the call. Uh, just a, a brief update as to what's going on with Wi-Fi and LTE device coexistence. Um, and for those who may not be following this, I mean, obviously there there are concerns around coexistence between Wi-Fi and LTE devices. Um, but really, the the industry uh, through Wi-Fi Alliance is making very significant positive progress on on resolving those concerns, and Wi-Fi Alliance is really serving as a forum um, for that work to take place. We are developing. Um, a coexistence test regimen for Wi-Fi and LTU devices, which will determine whether those devices do in fact coexist well with Wi-Fi. Uh, in fact, we are already in the validation phase of a, of a test plan to do that to do that testing. Um, and the, val the validation phase is really where we look at is is this is this test regimen feasible? Is it giving us a good answer? And is it repeatable? Um, and again, very very positive developments. Um, you know, I think the industry is is tackling this this um, this area in earnest, and in fact, just on Tuesday we had a a workshop to um, to progress the work forward. During the workshop, there was a lot of discussion around real world um, data about Wi-Fi deployments. Um, we were looking at ways that we can accelerate this work. I know, um, you know others on the call may talk about this later, but. Everyone understands that there are, there are very important commercial interests on the LTU side, um, that they want to get this deployed. And so we are looking for whatever ways we can to accelerate the work while still ensuring that we deliver that, that good coexistence and pr protect Wi-Fi users. Um, and then at the workshop, we also identified some areas where additional industry contribution is necessary. Um, and in fact, um, we've already had uh, companies step up and volunteer to, to help um, deliver in those specific work areas. Um, since Dean's on, I'll just give him a little a shout out, you know, Qualcomm stepping up and making sure that we're gonna have availability of LTU gear to validate the test plan. So again, I think that the key takeaway from that is, you know, there's a lot of work to get done, uh, but the industry is working productively um, to make sure that we accomplish it in, in a timely manner and we're balancing the needs of protecting Wi-Fi users while also understanding the, you know, the commercial interests of, of the companies that are looking to deploy LTEU. Um, so with continued engagement, if we continue to have industry players step up and do the work that's necessary, uh, we expect that we'll have a final test plan uh, later this summer. And that is the, uh, the end of my deck, Kelly, so I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. tell us a little bit about what you guys, uh, uh, William, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about um, what you folks are doing in Wi-Fi. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for uh, inviting us to speak during this uh, panel discussion. So um, our background is cellular uh, built networks for different cellular companies. And we see, we saw the need for uh, faster speeds, um, cheaper per gigabit pricing, as well as uh, uh, being able to provide the, for the demand that's going to be in the future. So what we kind of showed on our slide deck is a collaboration of what's going to be the future of Wi-Fi. Um, the, the whole concept of LTE and, and 5G that's coming up and that's trying to be solved is, is still not enough to compete with the growing demand of the devices and the increase in devices. We see that we see that uh, most of the devices are going to be in the home and going to be uh, going to be uh, a challenge to provide for all those devices. Uh, we've seen a lot of data showing that in 20, 2020 we're going to be looking at at least twenty connected devices, if not more, in each of the households. So, and that's something 
that current current LTE and even current Wi-Fi is challenged to have. So we kind of gave a, a, a display of what we see as the future of Wi-Fi and the future of LTE and 5G coming forward. I'm sorry, I'm seeing that my volume is in and out. Sorry about that. It's a little bit better now. I think so. Thanks, okay. Mike. So uh, the, the, a lot of people think that, that, that 5G is going to replace uh, Wi-Fi or even broadband, and, that, and that's not the case. I mean, again, we're talking about node density. And even if we look at node density for small cells and even new LTE and uh, 5G deployments, it just doesn't have the capacity to cover the square footage of cities. So as, as you can see, view on this screen, we'll see multiple cities that will start to adopt a Wi-Fi and LTE 5G plan, which will provide a robust data um, platform. If we can go to the next slide, please. As you can see, this is an actual city. This is a city in Dalton, which we have deployed. We've deployed in uh, cities in Georgia, Tennessee, uh, working on Idaho as, as we speak. But as you can see, uh, the lower portions are Wi-Fi search ring or coverage areas, and then the large blue portions, of course, are the uh, cellular one cellular site. This is pretty standard for tier three cities where they have one, maybe two sites covering their uh, area of five to nine square miles. And uh, the unfortunate thing again is, is it's just no density. We have a site that can handle up to 10,000 subscribers at any one time, hitting a city of maybe 30 to 50,000 people. So that's why we get into three cities, a lot of poor coverage or poor performance. We come in, we uh, deploy a city-wide Wi-Fi network, 802.11ac. We're also deploying the Wave 2 in some of the facilities and provide that next step, that uh, speed that's necessary. So with both of these kind of... Uh, technologies, it just needs to be understood. And, and even with LTEU, it's going to be the same kind of collaboration. We just don't have enough to satisfy the demand for what's going to be in the future of 20 plus devices, people connecting their, their refrigerators, their toasters, their coffee machines. And LTE and 5G won't be able to do that. The other thing is keep in mind is what we've done is we deployed actually without routers. So we have a lot of in-building uh, and homes that are covered in our coverage area, which now don't require even a router to connect. They simply connect to the access point that's on the pole outside of their home. So we kind of see the future going towards, uh, towards the uh, removal of a router similar to cellular mm -hmm. and that's why we took a lot of cellular concepts to it um, to create a uh, better more robust wi-fi so we believe we're kind of one of the first to take cellular concepts and bring it into wi-fi um, move away from uh, omni antennas a lot of sectorized antennas just like wi-fi design so we're really excited about what the future has to hold all those people trying to figure out if LTE or 5G is going to replace things. Our belief it's not because ultimately it's going to come down to we just cannot fulfill the demand that continues to grow on all these devices and connected devices in our homes. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, William. Um, I'm hoping that we'll hear more from you during the Q&A, uh, especially about those LTE design principles, which I, I think is uh, some fascinating concepts there. Um, we are going to move on to Patrick Welsh of Verizon. Patrick? Uh, thanks, Kelly, and thanks, uh, RCR, for uh, uh, having me on the panel. Uh, I want to spend a, a few moments uh, talking a little bit uh, about Wi-Fi uh, from a carrier's perspective, from Verizon's perspective, as we uh, build out and densify our network and move uh, really from you know the traditional coverage play uh, to the capacity play, and uh, you know what we're seeing is is uh, you know just this 
the spike in demand for for mobile broadband services um, where uh, you know the licensed and unlicensed spectrum has to be used in new and innovative ways and this is really i think one of the uh, yeah, the telling things of, of as carriers evolve their networks uh, turning to unlicensed spectrum you know unlicensed spectrum uh, as the slide says is a shared resource it's uh, has minimal rules to encourage innovation uh, that in, in innovation is is permissionless you don't need to knock at the door of the FCC to get a license uh, so long as you meet uh, the medical minimal technical requ uh, requirements uh, anyone uh, can use the spectrum for anything and uh, really the touchstone of unlicensed spectrum has been you know this fair coexistence as, as folks have said uh, next slide please so as uh, carriers like Verizon look to add capacity to the network, uh, we, uh, as, as uh, Kevin said, you know, Wi-Fi is an incredibly important part of our users' experience and how they uh, connect to the internet today. Uh, and that will continue, especially as we see the growth of the internet of things. We think Wi-Fi is gonna be a huge part, especially for, um, you know, inexpensive uh, connectivity. Uh, and we fully anticipate Wi-Fi offload to continue, if not increase. Uh, but there are limitations to uh, Wi-Fi as a technology. And I think that's why you're seeing this move to uh, extend LTE into unlicensed spectrum. Uh, we're doing it in a number of different ways. Uh, the first really is a, is a very rudimentary way of uh, coupling LTE with, uh, with a traditional uh, WLAN uh, uh, access point uh, and aggregating the channels. Uh, you also see that now with uh, 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 other versions like LTEU and LAA, uh, where we're actually extending the LTE interface into unlicensed spectrum. Uh, and we think that's going to continue. Al already we have uh, work being done in release 13 to um, uh, extend uh, uh, LTE and unlicensed spectrum to uh, countries that have a listen before talk requirement. And uh, already our vendors are looking at uh, uh, LTE and unlicensed uh, uh, solutions that don't require a licensed uh, carrier to handle uh, uh, signaling information. And that's with MultiFire. I'm sure uh, Dean will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, next slide, please. So just real quickly, uh, when we talk about LTEU, what exactly are we talking about? Here, the idea is that uh, you have a traditional LTE uh, connection and uh, the uh, unlicensed spectrum then uh, can be used to supplement uh, downlink. And so today, you know, you have uh, Wi-Fi uh, uh, in the 2.4 band as well as in the 5 gigahertz band. When we add uh, LTEU, uh, this is essentially what we're looking at. And go ahead, Kelly, if you can change slides. So what we're looking at with LTEU, oops, go back one is uh, looking at 200 megahertz out of the uh, available 555 megahertz in the 5 gigahertz band, uh, specifically Uni 1 uh, and Uni 3. And it's really those, those 200 megahertz that's going to be the focus of LTEU and LAA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, obviously, uh, with such a large installed base uh, for Wi-Fi and, and given the fact that uh, we rely on it uh, every day. Uh, it was really important for Verizon and our vendors to make sure that LTEU had uh, adequate etiquette pro uh, protocols that would not uh, degrade Wi-Fi performance. And so uh, what the LTEU forum did was uh, develop three different protocols that they uh, have combined together. This is just a quick flow chart of how that works. First thing to remember is um, LT the LTE network is the default network. So if uh, the LTE network is not congested, uh, unlicensed spectrum won't be used. Uh, but when the LTE network does become congested, uh, the first thing uh, that um, uh, LTE will do is, would, uh, is to look for an, uh, an open channel, you know, so it's dynamic frequency selection. If uh, there is an open channel, a vacant channel, uh, LTEU will use that channel. If there isn't an open channel, um, LTE will use, uh, LTEU will use the least busy channel and implement a dynamic um, duty cycle that will assign uh, bandwidth on a dynamic basis to uh, the various users. And then when the congestion 
on the uh, licensed network drops, um, LTE will surrender the unlicensed uh, channel uh, back to other users. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, so that's really all I, I wanted to say in my presentation today and happy to uh, answer any questions. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, I, know, I know there's a lot of questions about LTEU. We will get to as many as we can in the Q&A. Um, next, we're going to hear from Todd Mersh of XL Air. Todd? Th hey, Kelly. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll be quick so that we can get to that Q&A because the questions are starting to pile up back there. So you guys have heard a lot from uh, companies that you recognize. So you probably don't know who we are yet. Um, some of you do, some of you don't. So just real briefly on, on us. Uh, if you take a step back on what everyone's been talking about and think about the macro thing that's going on here, it's basically operators are trying to use whatever spectrum is available to meet this uh, capacity crunch that we're talking about. On top of that, to meet that, you have to bring the, the cell or whatever's providing the wireless service closer to the user. So actually I looked at that and said, all right, th to do that and do that effectively, you need tools that allow you to um, auto optimize how that the radio is being used. You need to have visibility on how the web network's working. You need to automate really the whole operational side of things. So that's a vision of the business. And we launched back in February of last year. What we found, and the reason we're on the Wi-Fi discussion today is that Wi-Fi is really facing a problem today in, in providing sort of an assurance, a, a quality of experience on a reliable basis, especially as there's more and more devices, more and more congestion, more and more contention for that unlicensed spectrum. So we focused in uh, on that segment first, um, and, and really we've brought together a group of folks who um, have a deep expertise on deploying carrier-grade networks, and uh, they've been doing this for many years. So we go to the next slide, Kelly. So one of the things that um, we've actually uh, seen and focused in quite a bit has been on the consumer market, actually. And I think it stands to reason, we've talked about this a million times already today, even it, people have more and more wireless devices in the home. They have devices that are not just their phone and their laptops, but you know, doorbells and other things. And what's happening is, is uh, and on top of that, more and more people are actually getting their Wi-Fi router from the service provider. The majority of people actually get their Wi-Fi router from the folks that are selling them internet but they're still being sold internet. They're not being sold Wi-Fi, right? So you're buying whatever speeds to your, to your house, but you're not being sold necessarily the, that connection between the Wi-Fi and the devices that you're actually using. Now that creates both an opportunity and a challenge um, for the operators that we're working with. On the challenge side, because there isn't deep visibility in what's going on, there isn't necessarily tools that are existing to, to help manage and optimize that side of things, you have a quality of experience issue. You have more and more care calls coming in about the Wi-Fi itself and an inability to maybe effectively manage that and, and, and deliver the right quality of experience because of that. On the flip side, there's an opportunity to, to improve that, to bring down that customer care expense, but also provide more services, right? To, to offer a, a voice over Wi-Fi type service, to maybe have a premium tier of, of Wi-Fi service, kind of take advantage of this, um, this emerging space where customers are more aware of the fact that Wi-Fi is, is actually the last mile of their connection or the last 50 feet of their connection. And down the line, you know, deal with the fact that really right now, IoT in the home is Wi-Fi and being able to enable those services. So what, you know, what do we think is missing? Because there are, there's great technology being um, pushed through folks like the Wi-Fi Alliance and others to deal with some of these challenges. Um, the ability to deal with the, the congestion in an adaptive way on the unlicensed spectrum. So providing that, that Wi-Fi performance reliability, automating kind of all the tools that you would need as an operator to deliver a carrier grade service um, at huge scale. You know, you're talking about millions and millions and millions of consumer devices out there and then giving the visibility into exactly how things are going, both potentially to the consumer, but also from the operator back in their networks. And we feel like if an operator can do this and do this successfully, that gives them a stronger play into things like managing um, multi-dwelling units and, and delivering services to small businesses in a more effective and, and cloud-style fashion. So and that's what we're seeing. Um, we see you know, if we can solve the inside uh, problem, we can then move out and, and, and deal with all of these other things like LTU and so on and so forth. So look forward to the Q&A. And with that, I'll just pass it on to, uh, to the next speaker. All right, great. And I'm going to pass that right along to Dean Brenner of Qualcomm. Dean? Thank yeah, thanks a lot, Kelly, and thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar today. So for those who aren't familiar with Qualcomm, we are the world's largest supplier of uh, uh, chipsets for uh, mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, IoT devices.
practices, et cetera. <clears throat> Last year, we produced over 900 million uh, chips. Hundreds of millions of those chips uh, had uh, Wi-Fi and other, um, other non-cellular technologies. All of our chips tend to be uh, multi-mode and multi-band, and um, we're one of the major contributors to NEC, as I'll discuss in subsequent slides, we're one of the major contributors to uh, all of the next generation uh, Wi-Fi variants that are under, under development, including uh, 802.11ax, 802.11p, the uh, DSRC technology that Kevin mentioned, and others. So with that, Kelly, if you can flip to the next slide. Thank you. So specifically for um, the Internet of Things, I think as Kevin mentioned, this is certainly a major focus for next generation Wi-Fi. And so we can really look at uh, a whole range of technologies, depending uh, in part on what spectrum band is available and equally depending upon uh, uh, the range of the connectivity that's uh, necessary. So in this chart, we're showing uh, everything ranging from 802.15.4, which you may be familiar with as a, a core technology that's used for th uh, air interfaces such as Thread and Zigbee for you know, mesh communications, which would be extremely low power and very, very short range, going all the way at the other extreme to 802.11ah, which is uh, a technology that uses the 900 megahertz unlicensed band uh, and is really a technology that was specifically developed with, um, with the Internet of Things in mind. The technologies in between are also, of course, very, very interesting, not just for the Internet of Things, but for, for Wi-Fi itself. So 802.11 AD is the technology that uses 60 gigahertz spectrum. So it uses several, giga, giga, um, several gigahertz wide of bandwidth to get extremely high data rates. Uh, you're just starting to see 802.11 AD devices just start to hit the market. These devices uh, would, could hopefully include uh, smartphones and tablets. They enable applications such as wireless docking. You can imagine actually uh, never opening your computer. You have your computer in your laptop case and you have a screen and a keyboard in your office and you, you just uh, come in and wirelessly your computer is docked to the screen and you just uh, off and run. Uh, all the way to, uh, in France, 802.11 AD has been demonstrated for very, very high bandwidth, extraordinarily fast movie downloads. So, you know, imagine downloading a, uh, an entire 4K movie in the matter, matter of uh, a second or two. Uh, and of course, we're not stopping with 802.11 AD. So the next, gener the next generation of that technology, even though 802.11 AD hasn't even really fully launched yet, is AY. And again, Qualcomm is very, very involved in that. Um, in addition, uh, I think as Kevin mentioned, the, the, the probably state of the art Wi-Fi would be 802.11 AC using what we call multi-user MIMO, uh, which gets uh, uh, data rates that are about the fastest you can imagine for Wi-Fi. But after that, as I mentioned, Qualcomm is one of the leading contributors to 802.11ax, which is really going to be the, um, the next Wi-Fi variant. You can, if you remember, going from 802.11a, b, g, n, now we're on ac, and from ac we're going to hop over to x. Okay, Kelly, you can flip to the next slide. So this is sort of a, a graphic depiction of how all these technologies might work together. I mean, you can, there, uh, one of the things that makes the Internet of Things so fascinating is there is no one technology, there is no one use case, there is no one architecture that will support it. On this slide, we're showing the use of 802.11, 802.15.4 uh, in, in the, within a room, AD, to get uh, uh, broader connectivity, uh, AX to cover a, a house, and AH to, uh, to cover even beyond. So we're very excited about all these technologies. And we, we do see, by the way, unlicensed uh, playing an important role in 5G. Uh, the LTEU technology, LTE unlicensed technologies that have been addressed uh, 
in, in by uh, Patrick are all use a 20 megahertz bandwidth. Uh, the next step after that would be a, a wider bandwidth unlicensed technology, which could using LTE, which could easily form a, a, a part of 5G. Why don't you flip to the next slide, Kelly, and I'll quickly wrap up. Yeah, so this slide shows the different uh, variants of uh, the LTE unlicensed technologies, which Patrick referenced, LTEU, LAA, LWA, and Multiplier, uh, as well as Wi-Fi. And we see all these technologies coexisting together. They've all been built from the ground up for coexistence. Qualcomm, as I say, has a huge vested interest in Wi-Fi, as do our customers, and so we're very excited about all of these technologies and how well they'll coexist together. So with that, let me wrap up and we can turn to Q&A. Okay, fantastic. Great, well, thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I am uh, going to start off with a question um, that, that talks a little bit about spectrum. Um, you know, one of Wi-Fi's significant features thus far has been uh, that it doesn't have to deal with the same level of spectrum fragmentation that, say, LTE does. Um, it offer, operates primarily in two global bands, but we're talking here about moving into new spectrum bands for Wi-Fi. Um, 900 megahertz was mentioned, um, and YGIG, I believe, op operates at 60 gigahertz. Correct me if I'm wrong there, Kevin. Um, but uh, so as we move into new spectrum bands, um, you know, how does that change the ecosystem for Wi-Fi? Um, I, I don't know, Kevin, if you'd like to start with that one. And uh, Dean, I imagine you might have some perspective there as well. Yeah, yeah sure. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, as a, as a, as a Silicon vendor, uh, Qualcomm may have some perspective on this as well. Uh, you know, the, these additional bands, it's just, uh, you know, new, new real estate for Wi-Fi, right? So for, for many years, 2.4 gigahertz was, was the workhorse for Wi-Fi. Um, but of course, with the, this explosion of, of demand for data and explosion in the use of Wi-Fi, um, it's actually quite <laughs> pretty amazing how long we have made it uh, using primarily 2.4 gigahertz with only those three non-overlapping channels. Um, so, you know, we are already in the in the process uh, as an industry of um, migrating over to 5 gigahertz. In fact, more than half of the devices Wi-Fi Alliance certifies are, are dual band devices. Um, and these these additional bands are just kind of the, the next step for us. Um, I will say that one of the, I would say the unique pieces with some of the newer bands, like uh, with Wi-Fi Halo and 900 megahertz and 60 gigahertz with with y gig um, is that these newer bands aren't just about um, kind of giving you more capacity same similar capabilities of, of traditional Wi-Fi you know higher speeds things like that um, in many cases they're they're delivering entirely new use cases so uh, you know y gig is an example because of those extremely high data rates you know mm -hmm. multi gigabit uh, data rates um, shorter range very high you know high potentially for high density deployments um, really allows you to do a number of very interesting use cases around docking you know wireless docking as, as Dean mentioned yeah. um, that, that are kind of unique and you wouldn't typically expect to see in something like five gigahertz. Uh, similarly with, with Wi-Fi Halo or, you know, uh, DMX's .11ah, um, very interesting capabilities because it's operating in, in some of this new spectrum. You know, very, very low data rates, very low power and long range and very robust connections. You know, how are you in the IoT where you're dealing with, um, it's, if you're dealing with real world range, you know, you're not out on a soccer field, a <laughs> soccer pitch um, where there's no obstructions. Halo is going to give you the ability to, you know, penetrate those walls, get down to those sensors that might be down in your basement and provide that robust link. So, you know, it's it, when you look at Wi-Fi as an industry going into these some of these new bands, um, you know, it, it's very, um, you know, deliberate and with the being mindful of what we need to deliver for uh, customers and markets going forward. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is Dean. Yeah. Let me, let me add on top of that. So the funny part is this is a little bit like back to the future, you know, 900 megahertz, the 900 megahertz unlicensed band is one of the original unlicensed bands. So there, you know, it, it, it's new for halo as Kevin, as Kevin reminded me to call it 802.11ah, but it isn't, it isn't a new unlicensed band, and 60 gigahertz similarly has been allocated for unlicensed for you know quite some time. Um, but just as in the cellular world, on the LTE side, 
uh, for in license spectrum worldwide, there are over 40 spectrum bands that have been standardized for the use of LTE. I think the same thing has happened on the unlicensed side, where, as Patrick uh, explained, the, the watchword is really permissionless innovation. So, as uh, equipment developer developers, app developers, chipset providers, we're we're, we're uh, device manufacturers. We're all looking for more spectrum for the right spectrum that can deliver the the, um, the service that's geared towards a particular use case so 900 megahertz of course is great because it's a it's a low band a sub one gigahertz band so the radio signal propagates a, a lot further which is uh, you know important to the economics of, uh, of an outdoor internet of things type application on the other hand 60 gigahertz, where there is uh, multiple gigahertz of spectrum, of uh, contiguous spectrum available, is great. Um, you know, in an indoor environment where uh, you have a, a huge bandwidth that you want to transmit and receive, as for example with wireless stocking or uh, or you know HD movie uh, downloads from a kiosk. So you know, I think the watchword is that uh, different applications uh, have different bandwidth requirements and through the policy of permissionless innovation on license spectrum is available to, um, to all of us. It's really like a public park. And so it's uh, whether it's low band or high band, uh, it can be uh, technology can be developed to meet the needs of consumers. Okay, great. Um, Todd, I wanted to come back to you. The, you know, when I interviewed you for the report, you brought up kind of an interesting um, thing, and, and I think this has a lot to do with spectrum utilization, efficiency, as well as that in-home experience. Um, you talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, most of the devices that folks get from, or most of the routers that people get from service providers today, you know, tend to get set up and they, they they stay on one channel, uh, they, they aren't dynamic, they don't uh, change, um, you know, and, and that sort of leads to, you know, to inefficient use of spectrum. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, do you, do you really think there's an opportunity, you know, can we optimize that more than what we're doing now? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think um, the challenge has been that the, the success, right? So the, the rate of growth has been dramatic and, and that has enabled really cost-effective chips to deliver Wi-Fi connectivity to everything, right? So all of a sudden you've got um, uh, an opportunity for a lot more congestion and then, um, you know, a lack of, and then just things starting to start up to, to take um, more intelligence to deal with that congestion, right? So one of the things, you know, I'd like to talk about data and, and, and be uh, empirical about these things. So we've got one of our development office in downtown Montreal in the heart of the city. So at any point in time, if we've got a Wi-Fi access point using our software running in the lab, we see 250 other Wi-Fi access points within range. Um, so it's pretty pretty congested area. <laughs> and we found that 92% of them pick a channel and stay there, right? And, and the corollary to that, or what you find out from that, is that at any point in time, even on 2.4, there's about two channels of the capacity that could be taken advantage of. So it's quite a bit, um, if you can figure that out and, and start to be more intelligent about how to use it, you can take advantage of that. And then you know, obviously with five gigahertz and some of these other things opening up, we'll, we'll start to look at how do you balance between 2.4 and five and things like that. The, the flip side too is if you can find those clear pieces of spectrum, it's gonna deliver a big jump in performance. It's pretty obvious, but I don't think people you know think about that is that you know when when you start to have a grumbly voice over wi fi call and it's and it's not what you're expecting it's generally because of of congestion issues of some sort so if you can if you can find that clearer piece of spectrum, you can deliver a big boost both in you know voice but also data services now Dean you know and that was one of the things that I noticed uh, from Qualcomm recently is that you guys introduced wi fi son. Um, which I think is sort of, uh, it sounds like, you know, Qualcomm's, uh, you know, offering to, you know, be more dynamic uh, about how Spectrum is utilized in a Wi-Fi setting and also allow, you know, OEMs to differentiate based on, uh, you know, their hardware's capabilities. Well, sure. Uh, again, um, you know, basically we have a all of the above approach. So we're trying to help uh, everyone in the ecosystem take advantage of uh, of whatever spectrum is available to the greatest extent because you know I've yet to meet 
a consumer who doesn't want better mobile broadband. That's what all of us in the wireless industry, certainly all of us at Qualcomm, yeah. are striving to to um, uh, to help deliver. And so, yeah, uh, Wi-Fi Sun is um, is is a part of that whole um, effort. Okay, William, I wanted to jump back to you real quick. Um, you know when. Both of us were at the uh, the Wi-Fi Now conference last week, and one of the things that you talked about was this idea of, uh, you know, of taking LTE design principles and bringing them into Wi-Fi. And I think that's part of the larger conversation here around convergence. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, not necessarily going with routers, going with, you know, Wi-Fi access points outside people's homes, and you know, and them still being able to rely on that for coverage. Um, can you talk a little bit about about that sort of Wi-Fi? LTE convergence in certain network design? Well, if everybody knows the history of Wi-Fi, it's pretty much been pretty standard um, antenna inside a facility. And, and with an omni antenna, of course, the power is distributed in 360 degrees. Uh, unlike uh, in cellular, which they've been, they had, interesting enough, back in the 90s, they had done designs because of power, uh, power power settings that weren't limited, they did designs in Omni antennas as well. So we saw a, a evolution of the 3G, well, P, PCS to 3G, 3G to 4G, 4G to coming up to 5G. And what we see is, again, sectorized antennas so that we have higher gain and better out-to-in penetration throughout, uh, throughout a coverage area. So. We deployed the same things. We, we used our cellular backgrounds to start deploying Wi-Fi in a more cellular nature, which allowed us to um, provide something that we're calling fiber to wireless to the home, because mm -hmm. uh, fiber to the home is a, a quite costly um, venture, given the fact that we can calculate the fiber to the pole, on the pole, but fiber to the home is such a moving variable. So we took, took that aspect and, and put a, a wireless AP on the pole, which is, you know, give or take 150 to 200 feet from the house. And uh, with a sectorized antenna, we were able to penetrate uh, most building structures very well. The other thing is, is that it simplifies the design. By having higher gain means that I have a strength, signal strength further away, which means I need less APs. And that's similar to what a cellular design does because the only difference is, is that the FCC requires Wi-Fi at a certain uh, power constraint and unlicensed uh, frequency has different and higher power uh, capabilities. So, so with that, um, we, we brought in that fact and it's been quite successful. We've had quite a few clients that are now ditching the complete router in the home concepts mm -hmm. so that they can be in their house, connect their TV. We connected LG 4K TV. Um, it does about 13 gigs a month uh, with over the top products. Uh, connected their laptops, connected their cell phones and tablets. And they like it because then they can walk out of their house and still be connected. So it's a very cellular feel concept just on a more, more nodes so that we can provide a better, uh, better performance. I mean, if we took cellular to the same concept, it, it would perform just the same. It's a wireless technology. Okay, great. Um, you know, I, I want to ask each of our panelists, we, we did have a question about what role Wi-Fi will play in 5G. And, and I think a couple of different presentations, uh, people talked on, uh, talked uh, to this a little bit. Um, but, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what role we think Wi-Fi is going to play uh, with 5G. Um, who'd like to jump on that one? Kevin, do you want to, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. I, I can jump in. So, um, you know, obviously we're, uh, you know, 5G, while it, it was certainly a, uh, uh, something has been talked about quite a bit, there's, there's still a lot to, um, a lot of work to be done to kind of solidify what exactly, you know, 5G means or what exactly is going to be part of the 5G portfolio. Um, you know, certainly from, from Wi-Fi's perspective, uh, we, we fully expect that, that Wi-Fi is going to be one of the components in 5G. Um, as, as I understand it, um, you know, 5G is not going to be a, a single technology, but rather more, more of an architecture to, um, you know, to deliver on 
the very, very diverse set of use cases uh, that we have facing us in the future, particularly in the area of IoT. Um, so, uh, you know, when you when you look at uh, you know from the power perspective, you know, uh, power efficiency perspective, from the spectral efficiency perspective, from you know range, uh, bandwidth, etc., you know, uh, throughput, etc. 5G is is defined in a way or is attempting to accomplish something that really no single technology could ever accomplish. And that's why it's going to be a basket of technologies. Okay. Um, and and Wi-Fi will will absolutely play a role in it. Okay. Um, anybody else thoughts on 5G? Yeah, this is Todd from XLA. I guess when I think about it, I think about um, 5G also is trying to take advantage of all different types of spectrum, licensed, unlicensed, partially licensed, you know, bringing topology into it to be able to deliver higher performance. So a lot of different things, uh, as uh, was just said, come together. Um, and then licensed is going to, unlicensed is going to be a big part of that as well. And, you know, Wi-Fi has been probably the most successful technology to tame unlicensed. And I think, um, you know, it'll be really about taking some of those techniques and learning and then applying that. So it's not really about whether Wi-Fi as we know it today is going to be a part of 5G. It's really sort of the, the experience expertise of, of mastering unlicensed spectrum that is going to be key as part, one of the key aspects of 5, 5G as we move forward. Um, we did have a question from the audience on uh, Facebook recently announced using 60 gigahertz YGIG, uh, a YGIG based solution uh, for high speed internet access, um, asking for comments on that use case versus wireless docking. And um, this was something that came up uh, at the Wi-Fi conference last week. Um, and I believe that at least part of what they're doing there is backhaul. Um, Kevin, I don't know if, uh, or I don't know if any of our panelists are are familiar with, um, you know, with using YGIG as a network technology rather than, um, you know, just sort of a point-to-point -point use case uh, like docking. Anybody have thoughts? Okay. Um, uh, another question about when do we expect to see YGIG deployments? Um, I believe we're starting, we expect to see devices um, sort of ramping up this year. Yeah, absolutely. This is Dean. Yeah, you there already are some, yes. but yeah, why you'll see why get ramp up uh, very broadly. I think between now and the end of the year, and then beyond. Okay. Yeah, and if I could just very quickly add on that. So, you no, know, yeah, Dean's absolutely right. There, you know, there are already uh, you know products coming to market that that incorporate Y gig. Um, you know. Qualcomm, Intel, et cetera, uh, that, that have, the, have these solutions um, that are coming out kind of ahead, ahead of the, the certification within Wi-Fi lines. And that's something we typically see is there, you know, certain, there are devices that are come out in advance of certification. Um, I think what we, what we typically see is uh, the availability of certification serves as, as an inflection point where you start seeing much broader adoption of the technology. So yes, you're going to see them this year uh, and you're going to certainly see the pace pick up uh, after our certification launches later this year. Okay, great. Um, you know, let's. Uh, we have a few different questions here on uh, on LTU and Wi-Fi. Uh, one is, you know, are there chipsets that work for LTU and Wi-Fi on the same processor? Um, you know, and uh, and then we also have um, some questions in terms of, you know, um, here. Let me uh, see if I can pull a couple of these. Hang on just a second, folks. Um, do we see um, Wi-Fi versus LTE as one technology, uh, you know, as converging, um, you know, similar to, to WiMAX versus LTE? Um, you know, I, I just want to, um, to talk a little bit about, you know, Kevin, I don't know if you can give us any more sort of insight into the coexistence work that's going on, you know, and Patrick uh, Verizon from Verizon, you know, I'm wondering if you can sort of let us in on, you know, some of the thought processes there. You know, you talked about the necessity of offload. Um, you know, and, uh, and I'm wondering if you can kind of, you know, give us some, some sense of, you know, how Verizon is approaching this and, um, you know, and your thoughts on licensed versus unlicensed uh, and coexistence um, within the network as well as, you know, fair play with, with others. Uh, sure. So this is Patrick. So the, uh, I think the way Verizon uh, is seeing Wi-Fi and, and LTEU is, uh, you know, their complements. And I think in certain situations we'll see, uh, uh, you know, Verizon using Wi-Fi offload in other situations where uh, quality of service is uh, important and uh, security and mobility. Uh, we'll see LTEU and, and uh 
uh, perhaps later LAA as uh, as the solution. So I think it's really about having multiple tools uh, to meet uh, the end users' uh, requirements. Um, and you know, it's just you know, and and that and and, and those tools and how they're deployed over time are are, are going to vary because uh, the consumer demand is 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 always changing. So, and that's why you know I think we're we're also very supportive of of the work to have a standalone version of uh, LTE and unlicensed spectrum mm-hmm. uh, because it'll it'll give uh, even greater flexibility, um, you know, to meet our customers' uh, uh, needs. Okay. Um, Dean, I don't know if you wanted to answer that question about if there are chipsets that work for both LTEU and Wi-Fi on the same processor? Yeah, so um, uh, not on the same processor. And there, there, uh, the integration of even LTE and Wi-Fi on the same processor is, is, uh, isn't, there, isn't there yet. But the, the, with LTEU, it just is on the download. So LTEU is not has no uplink in it at all. It's just uh, enabling uh, faster download. So in terms of the user equipment, uh, all that's necessary in the phone would be uh, the ability to receive at five gigahertz to receive the LTE LTE at five gigahertz. Um, in terms of the small cell, which would be the transmitter for LTEU, it it will both have the capability to transmit. Um, LTE in the five gigahertz band, and it has uh, uh, a uh, network listen capability because, as Patrick explained, it's uh, this channel selection process that it's going through and constantly repeating. It's constantly looking around and trying to determine is there a vacant channel because if if it's required to use the five gigahertz band. It has a strong preference for using a vacant channel, and then if there is no vacant channel, it's constantly looking for the least occupied channel. So, and then if it does go ahead and uh, use the channel, then uh, using the CSAT duty cycle uh, technology, it's taking turns with the uh, adjacent Wi-Fi access points and never taking more of it, never occupying the spectrum for more than its fair share. And then when it's all done, it vacates the spectrum. So that's that's the way the the technology works. Okay. Um, we also had someone ask about uh, <laughs> is 11P for V to V vehicle to vehicle really going to happen anytime soon? <laughs> um, yeah. So I could maybe take a crack at that. Yeah. Do you that one? Kevin, I don't know if you have perspective on that as well. Yeah. So Qualcomm is one of the early developers of. Uh, 802.11p, or what we call DSRC, dedicated short-range communications, which enables the the vehicle-to-vehicle, vehicle-to-infrastructure service. So uh, the Department of Transportation has set a goal of uh, adopting some sort of vehicle mandate. Uh, They would adopt it uh, this year, and then it would be effective uh, in the future in the 2020 timeframe. By the same token, uh, General Motors has said that they're going to have the fir- uh, um, a Cadillac model next year that will use the SRC. There are um, there's a whole proceeding at the FCC about the spectrum and about whether some of the spectrum could be shared between Wi-Fi and the SRC, reserving 30 megahertz of the spectrum exclusively for DSRC and uh, Qualcomm and others in the wireless industry have been strong proponents of that. Yeah, the, the only just very brief thing I will actually, and we're coming yeah. up on time, is that, um, in fact, within wi there is there is a task group of, of members who are actively working on um, a certification of, of DSRC and interoperability. Okay. Um, so it, it's ask- absolutely something that, that's on the, radar, on the roadmap. Okay, great. I'm gonna ask all of our panelists to answer one final question, and that is, um, you know, if you had to name one thing that you think will have the greatest impact on Wi-Fi in the coming years, what do you think that will be? I, I don't think we're going to have a chance to get into why, but hopefully uh, we'll, we've been over enough things in this in the course of this webinar that our, our audience will, will have some sense. Um, so, uh, William, can we start with you? What do you think will be the biggest impact on Wi-Fi? Um, I think that Wi-Fi will get rid of the router. We'll start to transcend towards the more the cellular model where we're connected all the time in and outside of our home. Okay, uh, Todd, your thoughts? 
Uh, I think the Internet of Things is going to have a big impact, actually, and we're going to, um, you know, we're going to have to figure out ways to to support that huge growth in, in connected devices and the, the way those devices behave differently and become integrated into our lives even more than a smartphone. Okay, uh, Patrick. Uh, I. I I actually agree with the Internet of Things, but I'll take a slightly different uh, tack and say I think it's really going to be important for Wi-Fi to develop Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi coexistence uh, standards, uh, mm -hmm. because as we add those kind of uh, that that kind of traffic, uh, there really needs to we really need to make sure that um, Wi-Fi is uh, is being a good neighbor to Wi-Fi. Okay, uh, Dean. Yeah, so I've yet to meet a person who doesn't want better mobile broadband. Every single person. <laughs> That. And and so Wi-Fi will be have to evolve to um, to try to be part of that, and will be part of the solution as long as well as every single other technology um, that we've discussed today. But everyone wants better bro mobile broadband now. Okay, and Kevin, we're going to end with you. Yeah, so I'm going to be I'm going to be lame, and I'm going to pick up an error of things as well. Um, so <laughs> I, I see it. Because of, um, for one, just the the incredible diversity of the use cases um, is is incredibly challenging for any technology to um, to do it all and do it all well, um, as well as just the the mass the proliferation of the number of devices within a single home and, and dealing with that with that uh, capacity crunch. Okay, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, the presentation will be available and this webinar will be archived. So thank you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.